this paper is the beginning of a project. Um, I should just say briefly that I have always been dissatisfied with the standard or textbook characterization of Kant's theoretical position, his idealism, uh, for reasons which I'll get into in the talk, and also been very dissatisfied with the lack of a very full discussion of what Kant could have meant by, subjecting, by, by suggesting that a morally righteous life is a life in which one's life is subject always and everywhere to the form of pure practical reason. That, by and large, is a very strange notion that a life should be subject to the form of pure practical reason. And it occurred to me a couple of years ago that these suspicions about the inadequacy of the standard interpretation of Kant's theoretical and his practical philosophy were linked. So this is an initial attempt to try to articulate that uh, intuition, very much a work in progress. The question of freedom in the modern German tradition is not just a metaphysical question. It concerns the status of a free life as a value. Indeed, as they took to saying in various ways, the absolute value. A free life is of unconditional and incomparable and inestimable value. And it is the basis of the unique and again unqualifiable respect owed to any human person just as such. This certainly increases the pressure on anyone who espouses such a view to tell us what a free life consists in. Kant's famous answer is autonomy, where this means first or minimally freedom from external constraint, coercion, and intimidation, thinking for yourself. But even more importantly, being in a specific sort of self-relation. I can only be said truly to be ruling myself when the considerations that determine what I do are reasons. But if, finally, in exercising reason, I am merely rationally responsive to inclinations and desires and aversions, I am letting such contingent impulses rule my life, however strategically rational or hierarchically ordered my plans for satisfaction turn out to be. So Kant concludes, I am only truly autonomous, self-ruling, when the one consideration of importance that is normatively authoritative in what I do is, as he says so frequently, if still mysteriously, the form of rationality as such. The more familiar name for such a necessary condition of autonomy is, of course, the categorical imperative. To make clear that this subjection to the form of rationality counts as autonomy, Kant also insists that this moral law be understood as self-legislated, that we must be able to regard ourselves as its author and that we are bound to such a law because we bind ourselves to it. But Kant's account is embedded in a much larger and quite complicated picture of the normative relation between rational subjects and the world in general. And we need to understand that picture and how the practical part of his philosophy fits in before we can return to the question of what he might mean by the freedom, autonomy, self-legislation equation. Quite a typical and bold indication of the core of that picture occurs in a passage from the section on the regulative employment of the ideas. Kant is describing the incessant attempt by human reason to find unity behind diversity and to reduce the principles of explanation to the smallest number. And he rejects the idea that we do this only for practical purposes, to save ourselves from trouble or merely to make it easier to organize the results of empirical inquiry. Instead, he insists, in such a case, and in general, reason, quote, does not hear beg, but command, unquote. This language about commanding is part of a well-known complex of legal and political metaphors Kant uses to state his basic position on our cognitive, practical, and aesthetic relation to the world. The Copernican turn in philosophy had already proposed that objects be understood to conform to our mode of knowledge rather than the other way around. And the understanding itself had been defined as, quote, the mind's power of producing representations from itself, the spontaneity of knowledge, unquote. Throughout the first critique, it would at least appear that Kant's case for the possibility of a priori knowledge everywhere depends on the notion of an active intellect prescribing or legislating or commanding that experience have a unity without which representational content would not be possible. As noted, this idea is also central to his practical philosophy. It suffices to quote what may be the single most important and ambiguous passage from his moral philosophy, from the Grundlage, quote, 
The will is thus not merely subject to the law, but is subject to the law in such a way that it must be regarded also as legislating for itself and only on this account as being subject to the law of which it can resort, regard itself as the author, the urheb, unquote. And while the third critique would seem to depart the most from a picture of a subject legislating and imposing, the argument nevertheless manages an odd indirect appeal to such a picture. <clears throat> Pleasure in the beautiful is pleasure occasioned by the experience of a formal unity and apprehension of the sort that would have resulted from such legislative requirements, but which is in fact experience independent of such an application. We can thereby experience pleasure in propositiveness, but without a determinate purpose. So the legislating commanding subject apparently retains its priority throughout the critical philosophy. But there is one further critical element to the picture the most important and the most compressed element. That dimension is summed up in the final entry in Kant's list of the concepts of reflection. Quote, matter and form. These are two concepts which lie at the basis of all other reflection. So very inseparably are they bound up with the use of the understanding, Unquote. Our legislating subject legislates the form of experience, the rational form of action, and the formal subjective conditions of experience in general set the conditions under which an aesthetic experience can be pleasurable and yet rationally demanded from everyone. Transcendental knowledge concerns the mode of knowledge, the erkenntnis art of objects, or the form of such knowledge, and a pure concept is only, quote, the form of the thought of an object in general, unquote. In the practical sphere, the moral law or categorical imperative is regularly said to be the form of pure practical reason as such. Since, according to Kant, unaided human reason has no insight into natural law or objective moral properties, only subjection to the form of pure practical reason can ground a rationalist ethics. This, of course, already sounds very far from our ordinary understanding of the urgency of moral obligation and the nature of the claim of such requirements. Why am I supposed to be so deeply committed to subjection to the form of pure practical reason. But this is certainly Kant's position. In the second critique, the quote, supreme formal principle of pure practical reason is said to constitute, quote, the autonomy of the will. The quote, formal practical principle of pure reason itself is said to be the determining ground of the will in such moral autonomy. It is clear enough that Kant means to say by these claims that when we act according to what he calls material principle, like the satisfaction of desire, or even in the pursuit of what we take to be substantive goods, we cannot be said to be truly self-determining simply because we have no control over what inclinations, impulses, and passions we happen to experience, or why some putative good should be taken actually to be a good. Whereas we have acted in a completely self-determining way, when we always attend as a possible constraint to any materially motivated action or to the setting of any finite end, to the purely formal character of any such maxim, <coughs> asking, in effect, if this maxim's form can satisfy the formal nature of reason as such, that it can be shared by all, that no exception is claimed for oneself. That much about Kant's intentions is clear but the link between this formulation about formality and the good or bad making features of our reasons has been a source of great controversy. So much for the standard summary and the standard picture. Let us say that it seems by and large to be an impositionist picture with spontaneous human reason imposing a self-legislated form onto the unruly material concepts of intuition <coughs> onto the unruly egoistic passions due to our sensible natures, and that such rational form provides the formal framework imposed as the form of all experience, within which the experience of some objects could occasion a distinctly aesthetic and shareable pleasure. Stated this way, without qualification, it is also an immensely unattractive, implausible philosophical account suggesting a crude idealism in cognition, a narrow, rigoristic, self-alienated, motivationally opaque moralism, and an unstable subjectivism in aesthetic. The picture is made even more attractive, unattractive by Kant's suggestion that the source of all such forms 
is reasoned self-legislating activity, as if we actually produce forms which we then impose on a recalcitrant, sensible materiality. What I want to suggest is that this impositionism is only superficially Kant's picture. The strategy will be to show that the self-originating and self-legislating impositionist picture is not faithful to the deepest insights of the theoretical philosophy, and then to suggest what implications this might have for practical philosophy. <clears throat> but even before proceeding to the details, there is an immediately pressing prima facie reason for doubting that this picture could be accurate. It saddles Kant with a position he could not possibly hold. In his epistemology, the fact that Kant thinks of the form of experience as having something to do with the judgmental form of thought, and the fact that he says the chief activity of the understanding is judging, nevertheless could not mean that he thinks of experience as consisting in judging, in the actual application of conceptual form to sensible matter as in predicative classification. That would mean that he would have to think that the perception of a red rectangle on a table in front of me consists in some silent and one would assume extremely rapid judgmental activity occurring in each perceptual episode, a token of the there is a red rectangle in front of me type. If that is not so, and when one considers the extraordinary variety of perceptual content in any moment of experience, it cannot be so on pain of absurdity. One must still do justice to the fact <clears throat> that Kant nevertheless insists that experience would not be possible without the understanding's activity. So how should we understand that activity? One way to think about this, and there are various positions about this very general issue in the literature, would be to align oneself with Peter Geech, who insisted that, quote, whatever one can judge to be so, one can also conceive to be so without thinking it without judging it, unquote. And so, as with McTaggart's non-assertoric thought, identify the internal structure of such a judgment and such a thought. This would all come close to Spinoza's view that a thought is by its nature assertoric. And so, to use Geech's words, only a background of adult conviction keeps a thought of a winged horse from being a judgment that a horse is winged. This is certainly relevant to Kant, but it does not yet specify the act of thinking or conceiving if this is not an act of judging. Likewise, by saying that experiencing cannot be simply judging, I don't mean to conflate judging with linguistic expressions of or reports of judgment. Experiencing is certainly not identical with those either, but that's another issue. Moreover, while Kant's account of the form of practical rationality might have suggested to some commentators that the actual exercise of such practical ra rationality in action simply consists in applying a universalizability test to explicitly formulated maxims, as if moral deliberation consisted in explicitly attending to the proper logical form of a material maxim, testing its universalizability, and then proceeding to act or refrain from action because the maxim passed or not. Although this is the standard picture, picture, there is nothing in Kant's many examples of ordinary moral deliberation to suggest such a picture. It is true that in the four famous examples from the second section of the groundwork, Kant writes as if an agent in doubt about the rightness of a possible action performs a universalizability test, thereby comes to see a contradiction, and therewith why a wrong action would be wrong. But he has already told us, as clearly as he could, that in such examples, he is not describing ordinary moral experience, but is making an abstract philosophical point. The examples are never meant to reveal what actually goes on in the assessment of a course of action as impermissible, any more than the claim that the form of our perception is judgmental is meant to suggest that perception consists in judgment. As Kant had made clear in the first section of the groundwork, quote, to be sure, ordinary human reason does not think this principle abstractly in such a universal form, but it always has the principle in view and uses it as the standard for its judgment. It would be easy to show how ordinary human reason with this compass knows well how to distinguish what is good, what is bad, and what is consistent or inconsistent with duty." Unquote. And later in the paragraph he says, 
But the most remarkable thing about ordinary human understanding in its practical concern is that it may have as much hope as any philosopher of hitting the mark. In fact, it is almost more certain to do so than the philosopher. For while he has no principle which common understanding lacks, his, the philosopher's, judgment is easily confused by a mass of irrelevant contradictions so that it easily turns aside from the correct way." Unquote. Now, to be sure, Kant goes on to explain that while we have no need of philosophy to clarify what we ought to do in any case, we are so tempted by self-love that we constantly devise arguments against the moral point of view and for the satisfaction of our desire for happiness. Accordingly, even common human reason requires critical philosophy as either a barrier or corrective to these temptations. But the elaborate detailed formulation and reformulations of the moral law in the second section and the casuistical discussion of examples are relevant only to this second order and defensive task and are clearly not meant to be articulations of ordinary moral knowledge or themselves a component of what he always calls ordinary human reason. Gemeine Menschenfeldung. And so the same question arises. What would be the right account of the actualization of pure practical reason? Reason in action, one could say, if it is not, as Kant clearly says it is not, such a continual testing procedure. The key to what Kant is trying to say lies, I think, in a proper understanding of what he calls spontaneity, what we can generally call the problem of conceptual or rational activity as a problem all its own. The most comprehensive characterization of that feature of human awareness that makes such activity conceptual or rational, normative in the broadest sense, is, in Kant's terminology, that such awareness is apperceptive. The argument is that any possible objective purport in experience, any intentional determinacy, thoughts possibly being about objects at all, has to be understood as a relation that must be established, cannot be understood as a result only of sensory interchange with the world, as if the mere presence of sensible objects and their causal modification of sensibility on its own, as it were, sets or triggers the content of conscious thought. This means that all contentful consciousness is a self-relation in relation to objects, although that self-relation cannot, on pain of regress, be itself a dyadic intentional relation or a simple self-monitor. Wilfred Sellers in his classic essay, Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind, put this point by saying that perception is, quote, so to speak, making an assertion or claim, unquote. It's not easy to spell this out because the character of the conceptual activity at work is difficult to describe. It, as noted before, it certainly does not mean that experience actually consists of some string of impossibly many assertoric judgments. But the key point is that any conscious attentiveness to content of a sort cannot be said to merely happen to a subject, but must be an exercise of what Kant called apperceptive spontaneity, even if not an exercise attended to as such. At any point when there is some need to do so, at any point in a conscious awareness or empirical knowledge, when there is some need to do so, a challenge or an anomaly comes up, any such taking can always be made into a judgment, so it must be of the character always to be available for such an explicit claim. That is, in all my conscious attentiveness to the world, there is some kind of implicit, continual responsiveness to the normative dimensions of experience, an openness, we might say, everywhere and always to whether I'm getting it right an openness that must be held open, all as a characteristic of my attentiveness. It is this feature of that attentiveness that for Kant and his successors forever makes a wholly psychologistic or naturalistic account of consciousness incomplete. I want to claim that there's a parallel phenomenon in play in what Kant must understand to be a kind of practical apperception, and so a parallel temptation to misinterpretation or overinterpretation. Awareness does not consist in judgments. And moral attentiveness and responsiveness, what Kant called Gemeine Menschenfernung, 
does not consist in universalization tests. I now want to take up some other suggestions from Sellers about this issue and follow through its implication for the practical philosophy issue. The first and most suggest important suggestion comes from paragraph 33 of his Kant book, Science and Metaphysics, where in support of the claim that, quote, it would be a radical mistake to construe mental acts as actions, unquote, he writes of our perceptual taking that, quote, it is nonsense to speak of taking something to be the case on purpose, unquote. Taking, he says, is an act in the Aristotelian sense of actuality, rather than in the specialized practical sense that refers to concepts. And that Aristotelian suggestion about actuality as activity is one that will form the basis for the remainder of what I want to say. By perceptual takings, as in taking there to be a book on the table, I understand Sellers to be referring to perceiving, in the sense he says of noticing, a book on the table and not taking it that what I am seeing on the table is a book. He's quite deliberately not talking about what he elsewhere called judgmental taking, but perceptual taking, which nevertheless has the form of judgment. What we want to understand in order to disabuse ourselves of any worry about excessive intellectualism in Kant um, <clears throat> is how considering perceptual takings as actualities <clears throat> in the Aristotelian set might help in such disabusing. However, these remarks are part of a larger Salarzian picture built up of the notions, our friends again, of form and content, as well as their parallel notions of actuality and potentiality. And we need a few more elements of his picture before we can appreciate the force of this claim about conceptual articulation. Those of you who are reading along, I'm going to skip some of this uh, Salarzian minutiae. Uh, since so that's not quite relevant to what I'm going to say. But we should note right away that by understanding the way such conceivings are in play as actualization, not judging, Sellers does not mean that we should think that some sort of mental activity is merely triggered into operation, or let us say occurs non-apperceptively. He says that the evoking of a red object in sunlight of this is red from a person who knows the language to which this sentence belongs is, quote, no mere conditioned response. This is just as true of the evokings of intuitional representings, the content of experience in Seller's view, because in the same way, quote, to know the language of perception is to be in a position to let one's thoughts be guided by the world in a way that contrasts with free association, with daydreaming, or more interestingly, with the coherent imaginings of the storyteller, unquote. This letting be guided in experience is thus somehow neither a causal notion of evocation, as if an activity is causally wrung out of us, nor a judgment in the sense of a decision of sorts about what is before me. It is this sense that Sellers can form, in this sense that Sellers can formulate his own version of Kant's famous same function claim, Kant's assertion at A79 that, quote, the same function which gives unity to the various representations in a judgment also gives unity to the mere synthesis of intuition in an intuition. Seller's version of that is, this is page 13. This is <laughs> at the top. In re this is Seller's. In receptivity, we do the same sort of thing we do in the spontaneity of, it, of the imagination. This is the same function as in judgment as in intuition. In receptivity, we do the same thing we do in the spontaneity of imagination, but we do it as receptive to guidance by objects we come to represent. We need also this following piece of Seller's interpretation, the most important. Sellers then warns against an extraordinarily common temptation, a temptation I think also at play in many of the accusations about Kant over-intellectualizing experience. Here is Seller's formulation, quote, the temptation is to think of the content of an act as an entity that is contained by it. But if the form of a judging is the structure by virtue of which it is possessed of certain generic, logical, or epistemic powers, surely the content must be the character by virtue of which the act has specific modes of this generic, logical, or epistemic powers. So it is not the case that we, unquote, it is not the case that we should think of the subject predicate logical form 
or the substance property categorical form, or any general form, as empty containers or something analogous to empty shapes or molds, which are either filled by sense impressions of, say, using an example Sellers does quite often, impressions of, say, the tall Tom is tall sort when we encounter the tall Tom, or which is sufficiently stimulated to stamp sensory impressions with the tall is Tom. <laughs> Need a better example. With the Tom is tall form. Tom is tall is just the specific way the SSP form is actual, manifest in actuality the discriminatory power that having the SSP form enables. That form is enmattered just by being this specific mode of actualization of the capacity, not by being some stuff that is shaped. And an empirical intuition a perception of a particular, a perception of a particular with an attribute, or the determination of a specific temporal relation between events are the ways any such generic powers are differentially, specifically actualized in sensible creatures like us. And we can already note that none of this is guilty of cognitivism or intellectualism. One's seeing the tall Tom approaching involves the actualization just described without one thinking or judging there is that tall Tom, or Tom is tall, or any application of concepts to sensory matter. Just, and here I think the most crucial of the examples in Aristotle, just as in Aristotle's account, the phronimus, the wise man's practical rationality is in the way he attends to ignores, selects, and dwells on, or not, aspect of the, aspects of the events and possibilities before him, just in that way, the power of seeing is for us a conceptual power. That does not mean it is not a truly sensual seeing, but rather a conceptual or judgmental power. Because it is a conceptual power, apperceptive as Kant puts it, it can always, as we see, also be attuned to, or open to, say, it actually not being Tom, I see. We see the tall Tom approaching in a way always open to cues that it's not Tom, because in perceptually taking it to be Tom, I am apperceptively aware of it being such a taking. Not aware of Tom and aware of the taking, but aware of Tom in that way in that adverbial sense. This is the way we see. It is not a seeing, also monitored by self-consciousness. This is now here the dangerous section. I've learned over the years, it's extremely dangerous to say in any audience anything about animals because people have a variety of views about animals. They tend to hold with more passion than they hold views about almost anything else. But So if you'll for, forgive me, I'll give it a shot, but I know this is controversial. This is also relevant to how the way animals have representations is different from ours. Theirs are intentional in their way, but they do not have the status of cognitions, as McDowell puts it. A dog might see a human figure far away, upwind, let us say, and seeing an unknown person begin barking, only later to start wagging her tail as the known person it really is comes into view. But what I think we have to say from the Kantian perspective is the dog did not correct herself. Here we do want to say that a perceptual cue prompted a response, one that we could even call a rational response, and then a different perceptual cue with more detail of visual features in view prompted a different behavioral response. I've never noticed, for example, that my dog, Molly, ever becomes embarrassed that she made such a mistake, which she often does, barks like crazy at everyone. Since she has no way of knowing that she made a mistake she ought to correct, that's not how she sees. She sees one set of cues, then she sees another. This would be one way of saying she has no unity of apperception. And here we might as well take fully on board the form matter, actuality, potentiality language 
Sellers is suggesting, and so the kind of holomorphism most interesting, soul-body holomorphism. Another reason why we shouldn't take the form matter as empty container filling content uh, as a model for what Kant is saying in either the theoretical or the practical philosophy, especially if we consider this example. In the standard analogy from book two of Aristotle's Dianima, the standard one Aristotle gives us, if he says the I were body, matter, seeing the power of sight would be its soul, its form. The distinct way of the being at work or first actuality of its body. There is thus no true separability even if there is a logical distinguishability between form and matter in this sense. A dead eye is not an eye anymore, except, as he says, homonymously, has the same name. So in a human, sensibly receptive creature, subject to sensory impressions, specific conceptual intuitings would be the distinctive actuality, the distinctive being at work of such a capacity in creatures like us. The temptation to think that for creatures like us, we must distinguish the sensory manifold from the form which informs it is the great temptation to be avoided, Sellers is insisting. The power of the eye's sight is not a power added to a material eye, as if there could be an eye identical in all respects to a normal eye, but which cannot see, and which would then be infused with the seeing power. The seeing power is the distinct being at work of that body. Analogously, when Kant famously says that intuitions without concepts are blind, he does not mean that we are first subject to blind intuitions, which can be said to become informing and guiding intuitions after concepts are applied to them. There are no blind intuitions waiting to be conceptualized. Kant means to be rejecting the idea of non-conceptual content, not specifying its initial blindness. Blind intuitions are no more determinate intuitions than dead eyes are eyes. It's also a mistake to ask a question like, how do sensations guide or constrain the application of concepts? The same mistake is asking, how do we compare our judgments about states of affairs or our experiences of states of affairs with the states of affairs? Experience is not guided by sensations. It is sensory awareness and can only be sensory awareness onto particular objects and events if it has the power of discrimination, a conceiving power actualized sensorily. Likewise, the contents of experience are states of affairs. Any reluctance to judge on the basis of such experience comes from what else we experience, not from any one-to-one -one comparison. So it is not the case that ostensible seeings are so necessitated that when we correct what we wrongly took to be what we saw, we are just otherwise necessitated. I've tried to say why this is not so. Ostensible seeings are just that, ostensible as such, apperceived in Kant's terms, and so always subject to correction, not alternate necessitation. And it all does not suggest that cognitive claims are simply up to us, as if we could irresponsibly judge there to be an elephant in the seminar room when there's not one there. The conceptual capacities that are brought into play, actualized in a perceptual experience that is properly understood in empirical intuitions of the world, amount to the kind of actualization called for in the seamless and generally unproblematic perceptual experience of the world. But those capacities, those same capacities, can be brought into play in another way, in another register, when in that experience, the actualization of an order of reflectiveness and assertoric claim making is called for, which while always available, is mostly not called for. This actualization is called for <clears throat> whenever something discordant in our perceptual experience occurs. We perceive at a later time aspects of the world inconsistent with what we took ourselves to be perceiving earlier. Or when a question is posed, did you really see a cube there? Of course, these suggestions are just suggestions at this point. They do nothing to establish that Kant's position was not impositionist <clears throat> in the sense I'm criticizing. But we've already quoted the famous same function passage from A79, and there are many others of the same tenor. At B138 in the second edition of the Doctrine, for example, 
<clears throat> Kant writes, quote, the synthetic unity of consciousness is therefore an objective condition of all knowledge. It is not merely a condition that I myself require in knowing an object, but a condition under which every intuition must stand in order to become an object for me. If I were king, uh, I would make it a requirement in every introductory Kant course that this passage and the one following be memorized by both student and instructor as touchstones for any future interpretation, because very commonly, of course, students are taught that the synthetic unity of consciousness is merely a condition I myself require in knowing an object. Likewise, and he, works hard, and he also works hard to insist that he is not turning the question of objectivity into the question of subjectively necessary unity. Quote, the concept of cause, for instance, which expresses the necessity of an event under a presupposed condition would be false if it rested only on an arbitrary subjective necessity implanted in us of connecting certain empirical representations according to the rule of causal relation. I would not then be able to say that the effect is connected with the cause and the object, that is, necessarily, but only that I am so constituted that I cannot think this representation otherwise than as thus connected. Another bromide or truism of the conventional interpretation he's explicitly denying. This is exactly what the skeptic most <laughs> desires. For if this be the situation, all our insight resting on the supposed objective validity of our judgments is nothing but sheer illusion." Unquote. The point of all these metaphors, of course, is to find as many ways as possible to suggest some modality of conceptual activity other than assertoric judging or acts of conceptual sorting. We can claim that we cannot be successfully onto objects without the actualization of a sortal discriminatory power even while insisting that the actualization of that power in the sensory presence of the object is still quite different from its actualization in judgmental sort. This is even clearer in practical context, I now want to claim, especially in consideration of something like practical apperception, the self-relation by virtue of which what I am doing is this deed of mine, not that, and not something happening to me or that I suffer. The full claim, which would require a lengthy separate discussion, is that my intention, any kind of conceptually mediated mindedness about the event in this context, should be said in some sense to be in the action, not before or behind it, in much the same way we discussed rationality for the Phronimos. The Phronimos, the wise man in Aristotle, does not apply principles in individual cases. He can't often tell you why it would be good not to go to war with Sicily at this moment. But as I said, his practical wisdom is in the way he attends to and sorts the world, rather than by applying maxims. He could summarize for you were you to ask what principle you're following in this event. I think that's true in all action. That is the role of ex ante deliberation and so-called reflective endorsement is much exaggerated and falls to the experience of what it is to be an acting subject. In initiating and then sustaining an action, I obviously know what I am doing and have some sense of why, and so can be said to be going on about my task knowingly, without that having to mean that as the deed unfolds, I keep checking to see if my intention is being fulfilled or if the action still fits the act, act description under which I became committed to the intention or if I still regarded it as a justified intention. I can clearly be said to be attentive to all of this without being attentive to the intention and act description and evaluation as such, just as I can be said to have plenty of reasons for what I'm doing without ever any acts of reasoning having explicitly gone on. To return to the point of the analogy with cognition, just as experience, perceptual knowledge say, does not consist in some series of empirical judgments so rectitude in a life does not consist in some kind of self-monitoring and self-testing. No impositionism anywhere, in other words. A righteous moral life is not one in which some individual has decided at some punctated moment in time to make the categorical imperative 
the superordinate principle of choice for all decision, as if there is some noumenal moment of election, a choice between radical evil or the supreme bonum. Rather, such a life involves a variety of discriminatory and evaluative capacities actualized in sensibly embodied ways as occasions demand. Prior to any putative deliberative moment, capacities for discrimination, perception, assessments of relevance, affective responses, and so forth, have already long since been engaged in ways that are conceptually complex and subject to possible direct assessment if something happens that calls for it, but not directly attended to as such. To return one last time, you'll probably be relieved to hear, to the analogy with cognition, when Kant says that the undetermined object of an empirical intuition is an appearance, a shining. I take it that he means, that he must mean, since he also says that we know appearances, that such an appearance is an articulate one without yet any explicit articulation having gone on. The object of an empirical intuition is undetermined, just as such. That is, I would have to stop and think about what it is exactly that I see, what would be relevant to answer a question I was posed, etc. It is undetermined for me. Likewise, as noted earlier, I can have several reasons for what I am doing without yet any reasoning having gone on or any clear sense of which reason is the most important. Prior to such an articulation by me, the reasons could be said to be as yet undetermined for and by me. I would have to stop and think about just why I was doing this or that. Or to say it in terms of the formula, the undetermined object of a human intention is a phenomenal action. So what gets attended to in practice as salient, of ethical significance, even what goes properly unnoticed in a division of labor in, for example, a well-functioning egalitarian society, race, gender, and so forth, a society with a rational form, what occurrence raises a question, what does not? Demand attention, what does not? Who is taken to be of relevance to the moral community, who is not, and so forth? can all be imagined to be of great, attended to, but unreflected weight in our practical world. Some so deeply unreflective and strongly held that it's very difficult to imagine, even though we can, ever question them. We have all of this in mind without any of it being before the mind. And yet it's highly implausible that such historically and culturally quite variant shared forms of practical life could be said to have any immediate direct presence in it, our experience on their own, as if pressing on our attention in themselves or from the outside. A highly complex conceptual or normative interpretive framework is at work, actual, and is available for reflection without it being the case that such a being at work is a matter of some explicit reflective endorsement or is the result of an articulated moral evaluation somehow going on as a mental event and so a distinct component of such normative mindedness. This also gives us a different way, or the beginning of a different way, to think about the autonomous individual. Commonsensically, we rightly understand the minimum condition for such self-rule to be freedom from external constraint or coercion or threat and so forth. In a general sense, we also accept what Kant introduces as a condition for such a self-rule being genuine. It should be rational. If we are under the influence of some urge or passion that tempts us to do something, we recognize we have no good reason to do, or very good reason to refrain, refrain from doing, and yet we satisfy the urge, we tend to agree that something is going wrong. We are not leading our lives in the proper sense. But we balk at what is taken to be the next Kantian step, that what it would be to be fully rational would be to submit our reasons for action to some consideration of compatibility with the form of rationality as such. That is the move that introduces all of the rigorism and empty formalism and difficult motivational worries. But these worries look different if we concede that by the form of rationality, Kant means a capacity for assessment that can no more be isolated as a kind of criterion than there are ever substances or causes in experience. There is this substance or that cause. Or that we can understand seeing without understanding it as the seeing of a kind of eye, a human, or a bat, or a fly, say. There is no seeing as such, 
there's always only the spe species-specific actualizations of such a power. And it looks different if we understand the actuality of reason in a human life as a capacity for justification specific to, relevant to, the way in which some form of life at some time calls for or does not such justifications and acknowledgments. The idea of autonomy as the capacity of an individual to think for herself, of such thinking as the genuine deliberation necessary for self-rule only if rational, and of the standard of rationality conceived in the formal way I am suggesting Kant does not hold, all begins to look different if we consider how Kant meant us to understand form and activity in the theoretical philosophy. To be sure, in the practical context, there are things we clearly do on purpose. There are genuine actions that are up to us, not only implicit actualizations. But these actions are initiated, let us say, fairly far downstream already within some complex understanding of the context of possible action, the available alternatives, and the relevant criteria for assessment. There are practically relevant perceptual takings that are hardly the result of how we might decide how we ought to look at things. And it is only in such determinate contexts that rationally evaluative capacities are drawn into play, and this again in ways that are not simply up to us. There is also, of course, deliberation where what we ought to do is not clear. Is this action a betrayal of friendship or what a good friend ought to do? But the terms of the deliberation and the relevant options must still be understood as aspects of the actualization of our rational capacities and not as resolvable by something like a free decision. It's much the same as cognitive deliberation. Was that a dog or a wolf I saw? No one finally simply decides what the answer shall be. Now, admittedly, this all begins to look very different from the historical Kant. He certainly did seem to think that freedom required minimally an ability, as it, as it is said, to step back from what we might be inclined, even powerfully inclined to do, and deliberate about what we ought to or may do. And this simply qua rational deliberator, having put out of play all considerations except what it would be rational to do. His account of moral responsibility has always suggested to many that he meant for us to consider each action as chosen, that in cases of moral temptation, we should think of ourselves as like controllers faced with a switch with access to a guidebook about tests, either act for strategically rational self-love or act, elect to act only on maxims that could be universalized according to the rules of the guidebook. Such election would, of course, only be possible in Kant's noumenal world, unconditioned and so not in time, and so a choice for which we bear sole and absolute responsibility. Moreover, given what is accepted as Kant's picture of moral conflict, a struggle between inclinations, all species of self-love in one way or another, and what we know to be the right thing to do, the argument is there just cannot be a continuity between Kant's practical philosophy and his theoretical philosophy, if the latter is, as has been claimed, non-impositions. Moral life, according to the canonical Kant, is certainly the struggle to impose what reason demands onto the resistant passions of self-love we are naturally subject to. And as already conceded, there are certainly passages where he seems to be saying that the question of whether our lives could be said to conform to the form of rationality and so count as autonomous was indeed a matter of continually testing maxims for universalizability or for conformity to some moral ideal, respect for persons as ends in themselves, said to be equivalent to the universalization test. It's too late in the evening at this point to turn to the minutiae of Kant's interpretation, but I think we should at least hesitate before concluding that while Kant might not have been an impositionist in his theoretical and aesthetic philosophy, he was in his practical philosophy. It may have served Kant's purposes occasionally to lay out the issues and alternatives in stark and somewhat simplified terms, suggesting man-made empirical objects and self-monitoring maxim testers. But when one considers his overall position and more of the details, it looks less likely that the core canonical formulations should be taken as his last word. Consider this one last indication of the complexity of his position. Very early on in book one of Kant's religion book, he attests in a striking footnote, somewhat surprisingly given how contentious Kant was with all criticism. He, could, he uh, attests 
to his deep sympathy with Schiller, the author of one of the most famous little poetic objections to Kant, that if I aid my friend, I should find some way to dislike the friend, or the, for the Kantian, there would be no moral worth in the action. But in praising Schiller's essay, Über Anmut und Würde, Kant, while agreeing that actions done from duty are not properly understood as ever graceful, he says they rather inspire awe, he surprisingly agrees with Schiller that there's something wrong, objectionable, about the picture of someone who experiences doing his duty as, one has to say, the difficult imposition of a constraint on what he would truly like to do, doing his duty always reluctantly or grudgingly. Kant writes about this, quote, now, if one asks, what is the aesthetic character, the temperament, so to speak, of virtue, whether courageous and hence joyous, or fear-ridden and dejected, the answer is hardly necessary. This latter slavish frame of mind can never occur without a hidden hatred of the law. And a heart which is happy in the performance of its duty, not merely complacent in the recognition thereof, is a mark of the genuineness, echtheit in the virtuous disposition." Unquote. It is true that Kant is here commenting on virtue, not autonomy as such, where virtue is something like having an autonomy as an end. But his general point seems to be about the genuineness of moral motivation, a more general condition of both moral worth in individual actions and virtue as a life in a whole, as a whole. So even if individual, uh, even in individual cases, when the question is whether the moral law has been the superordinate factor in the decision, this kind of remark suggests a far more complicated set of conditions for the attainment of this commitment, the out of duty, truly out of duty state of mind, than what strength of will or resolve alone can achieve. That's quite consistent with hating the law. And since our moral vocation requires us always to strive for such a dutiful state, whether as a ruling principle in all our actions, virtue, or in any act as an individual, such conditions are essential to the achievement of what morality requires. To experience the moral law as a painful constraint imposed on what would otherwise want to do is, Kant is suggesting, even if one ends up doing what duty requires, and because it is required, evidence of a sort that one has not yet genuinely made the right the determining ground of one's action. He says that without the right joyous frame of mind, Kritika Gemutstimmung, we won't ever know whether we have attained a true love of the good. That is, whether we have the condition he calls having incorporated, aufgenommen, such a concern with the morally good into one's maxim. Or put the other way, even the fact that the moral law wins out in some conflict with self-love is not evidence of itself of a morally righteous action, but it's at most still only a legally complex, correct compliance. Kant, of course, is famous for expressing skepticism that we can ever attain anything more than legal compliance like this. But he is suggesting that the picture of a dualism between sensible inclinations and a constraining, regulating moral law, an impositionist picture, is not something we should consider the default position. It's not the true picture of a moral, or said more broadly even, on autonomous life. The passage indicates that subjection of my will to the categorical imperative may be a necessary condition of autonomy, but it's not sufficient. And this opens up onto a lot of issues not usually associated with the canonical Kant. For if a purely autonomous life does not involve some sort of mere rule over our rebellious affective lives, then it's also true that we cannot manage to have the proper affective attunement, the avoidance of a dualism between affective matter and rational form, simply by choosing to have it, as in choosing to love doing our duty, which you obviously can't do. The conditions that must be fulfilled for us to be in the position of having genuinely adopted moral rightness as of superordinate importance in what we do are not then themselves simply up to us but require a sort of socialization and education and effective relationships with parents and other members of what Kant calls the ethical commonwealth. This would suggest that the form of one's actions could not count as rational in isolation, that it depends on whether the form of one's life as a whole is rational, and this might then depend in the sense just suggested 
on whether a community's form of life was rational. Perhaps this would mean that a certain economy of shared effective and evaluative responsiveness had been achieved and had become interwoven into the fabric of the self-understanding, culture, and educational practices of a community, all such that the possible achievement or actualization of autonomy might be more a social than an individual achievement. Let me summarize one final time the claim I'm making with reference to the critical self-legislation thesis. There are several levels to constant systems that we must be able to regard ourselves as the authors of the law, and that it is self-legislated, not, let us say, merely self-administered. It clearly involves thinking for oneself, not being coerced, cowed, intimidated, subject to influences and impulses, in some way responsible for one's choices. Secondly, it must mean that in opting to constrain everything I do and to set my own ends according to what is rational, there is no other consideration moving me except reason itself. But the Arab paradox begins here, that I am rational insofar as no other consideration other than reason moves me, and that is what being rational is. But neither of these formulations does justice yet to the strong language of authoring and self-legislating. Kant does not say, I am the rational executive in this legislative analogy, but am legislative. So there must be a third and deeper formulation of autonomy. The claim clearly cannot mean that one formulates for oneself what will count as rational. The form of rationality just is the form of rationality. But Kant's language suggests that this form is in itself motivationally inert, just a logical form, and in that sense indeterminate, unless and until I legislate it as a superordinate practical principle of my life, against something I can't be said to do at a moment in time. It would then be the rational form of my life, not, as one usually hears about Kant, that my life should be understood to change so that it has the form of a purely practical rational being, not even, in a sense, a human being. I cannot legislate the law as the law, but I do, in a very complex and long-term way, legislate that it be my law. I must, if it's to be my law. The Arab paradox then returns. Understood this way, it will be very difficult for Kant to keep distinct what the form of reason considered simply as such means, and what the form means amounts to when actualized as a life principle. That will largely depend on the concrete form of life itself. And all of this, of course, begins to sound less like the sage of Königsberg and more like the wise Schwabian from Stuttgart, but that's hardly worrisome in itself. Thank you for your attention.